Welcome to everybody. In this Robotics 2 uh, lecture, we will uh, consider the problem of tracking trajectories which are defined in the robot joint space. We will uh, use essentially uh, a combination of nonlinear and linear control techniques in a way that turns out to be very successful. The problem is uh, a bit harder than uh, the case of regulation uh, and we will uh, divide uh, the possibility of uh, control design in two parts. In the first part of this lecture we will uh, essentially assume that we have uh, a full model, dynamic model of the robot available that can be used for control computation. In the second part of the lecture we will instead start from an assumption of very poor or absent knowledge of the dynamic model. So the first uh, possibility of reproducing a trajectory um, with a command, a desired trajectory in the joint space, is to start from the robot dynamic model here expressed in the symbolic Lagrangian form and for the matter of uh, this presentation, we will uh, merge the uh, all terms which are non-inertial, so except for the uh, inertia matrix times acceleration, so Coriolis and centrifugal term, gravitational term, whatever friction model we are uh, including, into a vector n of q q dot, just for the matter of compactness. So if we start from this dynamic model and we have a desired trajectory which we assume to be twice differentiable with respect to time, this desired trajectory may last over a finite amount of time between zero and capital T or maybe uh, persist for a, an infinite amount of time. So if we want to reproduce this trajectory, we know that this is a typical inverse dynamic problem and it can be also casted as a control problem Namely, we design a feedforward tor torque which in nominal conditions, so assuming perfect knowledge of all the dynamic terms in M and N, uh, yields exact reproduction of the desired motion. However, we should add to this statement uh, the fact that the actual initial state of the robot, so the configuration at time zero when this trajectory starts and the velocity at time zero are matched with the desired quantities, equivalent quantities of the desired trajectory. Um, this computation is purely algebraic, we know that it can be implemented using the Newton Euler, but has some drawback. Because in practice uh, there are a number of situations that uh, puts ourselves in real conditions which are different from the nominal one. First of all, the initial state may not be matched with the desired trajectory. So we have an initial position or velocity or both errors that should be recovered. If we just apply the feedforward term computing by inverse dynamics, we will never reproduce the trajectory under this condition. And of course, there could be disturbance occurring during motion. Uh, the, the actuators may not deliver exactly the torque that you expect them to deliver. Uh, in your computation, you may introduce some small errors due to the truncation of data. Uh, most of all, you may have uh, some inaccuracy in the knowledge of the robot dynamic parameters, in particular because you have a, a payload which is not exactly known. So all this thing will... Uh, drive the system away from the desired trajectory if you don't take some uh, recovery action. Uh, in addition, there could be some uh, model dynamics that you have neglected in the, uh, in the modeling phase, so you're doing inverse dynamics based on a fully rigid robot model, whereas some flexibility effect may be present, for instance, in the transmission elasticity, or the friction term that you have modeled does not capture the whole complexity of dissipative dynamics and friction phenomena. So, uh, pure inverse dynamics will not work. So the idea is, as I anticipated in my first lecture of this course, is to introduce feedback. 
So, uh, first of all, we will use a hat in order to uh, express the fact that, in general, the dynamic terms that we are computing are not the real one, but they are the best possible estimate possibly obtained after an accurate identification offline procedure. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the U hat desired uh, is in fact a f a computed based only of, on this information and on the desired trajectory, and it can be computed fully offline uh, by the Newton Euler efficient algorithm. Now, if we wish to make this uh, control scheme more robust with respect to uh, error in the initial state, disturbances, and disturbances that will uh, happen at some time during motion, and which will uh, mean that the, if we reset the initial time at the moment where the disturbance has occurred, we are again in a situation where the initial state is not matched with the trajectory. So this recovery of initial position and or velocity error is something that we would like to um, compensate for at any time during the execution of the trajectory. So feedback is introduced, but we may have also a, a kind of blending of feedback and feedforward terms in our control scheme. And this may be, mm, may be based also on some computational requirement. Typically, if we can move some computation offline, then the online uh, real-time uh, computational burden will be reduced. If we do everything uh, based on uh, measurement information that we uh, acquire in real time, so we're closing the loop with respect to measurement, then the online effort in computing the control law will be higher, especially if we have a very complex model. So we, will, uh, uh, we can imagine to follow a two-step control design. This is very convenient as a general approach because we try to uh, handle the hard non-linearities of, of our uh, of robot models. And we can handle them exactly as we did for the regression task, compensating them to a feed forward or cancelling them by feedback. And of course, this feedback will be of the nonlinear type. If we are able to uh, cancel all nonlinearity using a nonlinear feedback, or even if we are compensating them in part using feed forward or a mixed um, um, combination of uh, these two actions, the second step in the control design is usually made on the linear side of the problem. So if we have canceled all nonlinearities, the resulting the resulting system may look like or behave like uh, a fully linear system. And so on the linear system, we know a huge variety of uh, um, control design methods that allows us to stabilize the trajectory error to zero, and which is our final target. We can have asymptotic stability, local, global, and eventually may also reach exponential stability. So, all is uh, um, referred to uh, a reference trajectory, which is a nominal one. So we are stabilizing the error with respect to the desired trajectory, and not with respect to a constant configuration or an equilibrium state. So uh, with this in mind, uh, we can introduce a number of uh, trajectory controllers, starting from the most simple to implement to the most complex one. So the first idea is to add to the inverse dynamic uh, compensation, so the inverse dynamic computation, which we call the feed-forward term. We will use uh, this FFW as a, an acronym for every uh, thing which can be pre-computed offline. Uh, we, we can add to it uh, a, a PD action on the position and velocity error. So again. The PD stands for proportional derivative, so proportional to the position error and proportional to the derivative of the position error, which is nothing else than the velocity error. And this time, remember that QD is a twice differentiable trajectory, so QD dot will be different from zero in general, as well as QD double dot. So uh, the control will be uh, the inverse dynamic term, U hat of D, 
plus kp and kd multiplying the position and the velocity error respectively. And typically we choose here positive definite uh, symmetric matrices. There's no uh, special need of not using diagonal matrices which would simplify the task and we would lead at least for the feedback part, the one uh, that measures the current Q and Q dot, uh, making it a decentralized type of scheme. Uh, you may also uh, introduce a slight variation to this uh, basic uh, feedforward plus PD action, namely uh, introduce a form of variable PD. You can see that the only difference between the first and the second control law for trajectory tracking is in the presence of the estimate or the actual uh, inertia matrix evaluated along the desired trajectory QD and not the current value Q. So, uh, what is the sense of all this? Uh, in the first case, when you have an error, uh, let's say on one joint only, and you're reacting with some KP and KB gains on that joint, uh, the facility of bringing back uh, that joint to this desired value depends on how large the inertia of the robot is in the current configuration. If you have to move a little bit a system with large inertia, you will need more control effort. If you need to move by the same amount uh, a system which has smaller inertia in that configuration, you will need less torque effort. So with this in mind, uh, it makes sense to modulate the constant gain KP, KD by the actual or the nominal, let's say, uh, inertia along the desired trajectory, which is a term with, that you compute uh, a priori offline. So in this sense, when we are getting uh, in the vicinity at least of con the desired configuration where the inertia is large, the effective proportional and derivative, the derivative gain will be amplified by the factor m hat of QD. When instead we are uh, in a situation where the inertia is uh, relatively small, then accordingly the actual um, PD gains will be modulated uh, in, uh, in the direction of a reduction. So, um, this tends to make the behavior in reaction to error quite uniform in the configuration space of the robot. Both this simple control law uh, are quite, uh, I mean, typically realize a local stabilization of the trajectory error. So, they work reasonably well, provided that the error is initially small and remains small. Uh, actually, there has been proof for the first controller that by suitably choosing KP and KD depending on the dynamic parameter or the dynamic term on bounds of the dynamic terms of the, of the robot, one is able to provide also a global stabilizing uh, asymptotic stabilization proof. But uh, the analysis is quite complex. So, uh, the next step, which will be, let's say, our principal uh, method in this uh, presentation, uh, is based on introduction of more feedback, and in particular, uh, a feedback uh, which achieves in the closed loop exit linearization and decoupling. So, uh, proceeding along the same um, uh, generalization of that moves from one to two, uh, we replace the uh, nominal inertia matrix evaluated on the desired trajectory by its evaluation on the actual trajectory, so on the current configuration Q. And this will multiply the P and D gains, and we will use also an additional feed forward, because we know that uh, if we uh, are uh, at zero error in position and velocity, still we need a fit forward acceleration to uh, continue to track the desired trajectory. In addition to that, and most importantly, we also cancel 
all the remaining nonlinearities in the model. So we have a, a, an n term, which includes coderies, centrifugal, gravity, friction terms, whatever you have considered as model, uh, which will be completely cancelled from the picture in the closed loop. Indeed, this happens to be, to be true only if the estimate m hat and n hat are equal to the real value in the dynamic model uh, of the um, sorry, of the uh, real robot system. But we will make this assumption for analysis which simplifies a lot and we will later on handle the case of uncertainty. So this uh, is called feedback linearization because uh, in the nominal case uh, we will achieve a closed loop system which is exactly, not approximately, exactly a linear system with linear dynamics which is easier to control. So the control law is not completed at this stage. So this method is called computer tor. Uh, this is a traditional name, but feedback linearization is the general framework. In fact, we will comment on that later, that this methodology is a, a common one also in other than domain of engineering. There is a slight variation of this in which uh, after applying the linearizing feedback, so essentially the m hat and the n hat cancelling or compensating for inertial changes, uh, in, on the linear side of the problem, you complete the design also with an integral term. As we know, as we have learned also for the regulation task, the uh, integral action compensates for uh, constant disturbances or uncertainty in the model, although the whole design becomes a bit more complex in this case. So uh, option four is equivalent to option three. Uh, the option three is the most common one in the literature. So uh, let's look again at the feedback linearization control scheme uh, to make some, a few considerations. So we start with this uh, yellow block, which represents uh, our robot. In fact, the real robot or the best dynamic model that we may have. As you can see, we start from the output. We want to control Q, and we would like the Q asymptotically track some profile Q desired of time. Uh, we move uh, one integration uh, back, uh, and we have the velocity. One integration back, we have the acceleration. O obviously, those integrators should be considered in parallel, so there's a, a bunch of parallel integrators, as many as the number of joints. Uh, so when we have the acceleration from, uh, we know that the acceleration is uh, the result uh, of the application of torques and of other uh, state-dependent terms, the centrifugal terms, Coriolis terms, friction terms, gravity, and so on. And from the model, we can isolate Q double dot by pre-multiplying by the inverse of the inertia matrix, which, by the way, is always non-singular by definition. So this yellow block represents, in this slide, the real robot, no? receiving torques U uh, and outputting a, a measurement of a, um, encoder measurement of joint variable Q. Now, the feedback linearization control uh, does uh, it achieve its goal in two steps. First, we use the actual measurement Q and Q dot if we don't have a Q dot uh, directly measured by tachometers, like is always the case. We can estimate this from numerical differentiation of the encoder measurement as usual. So we will, make, uh, we will consider that we have, in fact, a good estimate of Q dot. And with Q and Q dot, we compute the terms M. And of course, I'm using N hat because this is something that we compute in your uh, control software code. And we generate then the torque U as uh, the sum of this term and of a new signal, which I call A in red, uh, which uh, is pre-multiplied by the inertia matrix evaluated again at the current configuration. Now, if we are in nominal condition, this type of nonlinear feedback, uh, it's nonlinear because we are taking the measurement Q and Q dot and elaborating them 
through quadratic operation, a multiplication of terms, um, trigonometric evaluation, and so on. So all nonlinear operation. So suppose that all the data that we are using uh, in the inertia matrix and in the other nonlinear terms in the model are the correct one. So if m hat is equal to m and m hat is equal to n, with this short hand notation, then we have the following balance. On the left hand side of this equation, m q q double dot plus m q q dot represent the uh, dynamics, the nonlinear dynamics of the robot. On the right hand side, instead, is some it's what we are computing in our control law. So this is what we have to implement by software m of q times the new signal a plus n of q q dot. Now, in the presence of uh, ideal uh, equality between m hat and m and n hat and n, of course, the two n cancels, like it is shown. And since the uh, inertia matrix is non-singular, uh, the solution of this set of apparently still non-linear differential equation uh, is the same as the solution of the equivalent fully linear and decoupled differential equation obtained by pre-multiplying the two sides of this identity by the inverse of the inertia matrix. So we have obtained, in fact, in the closed loop, after this feedback linearization control, um, a model which is represented by q double dot equal a, where a is a new input that needs to be designed. As you can see, this is a purely uh, kinematic relation, uh, which relates the acceleration of the joints to the new variable a, and in particular each acceleration q double dot i to the new value of the uh, external command ai. The reason why we call this A is because, in fact, dimensionally, this is an acceleration. And now you complete the design on this linear and decoupled system. Uh, the decoupling means that, in fact, every new input AI affects one and only one of the output uh, variable, in, in particular the one with the same associated index I. So, uh, in the block diagram, uh, a PD gains appears as feedback from the position and of the derivative of the position, so of the velocity, uh, and they are combined with a, a feed forward combined terms, which includes also the same KP and KD. This is a kind of a strange format, but uh, it's, uh, I'm writing this block diagram in this way because I would like to separate what I'm measuring from the system, so from the robot, so kd times q dot and kp times q, from what I'm computing based on the desired trajectory. In fact, if you uh, rewrite a uh, as the difference between uh, q double dot desired plus kd q dot desired plus kp q desired, and the uh, feedback uh, action with the red lines in the picture, you obtain uh, the control law on the linear system that will achieve global asymptotic stabilization of the trajectory area. In fact, uh, A can be written as the feed forward terms in the acceleration plus KD which multiplies the difference between the desired velocity QD dot and the actual velocity Q dot plus uh, again KP that multiplies uh, the error between QD and the measured Q. And indeed, since the system, after the first step of this control design, was uh, already decoupled, there is no sense in choosing uh, gain matrices which are not diagonal, so that we can preserve locality of the linear design as well. Now, if you plug this A into the expression of Q double dot equal A, and you bring the q double dot to the other side, then you will have q double dot desired minus q double dot, which is the second derivative of the uh, joint position error, uh, plus kd e dot plus kp e equal to zero, and this characterizes the transient response of the system to any initial position and or velocity 
ever. So it says how the uh, acceleration error will change. And if you choose KD and KP positive, these are necessary and sufficient condition on each joint uh, in order to have uh, asymptotic stabilization. Actually, you have exponential stabilization of this type, and you have it globally, because the system behaves as a linear system, and we have seen that uh, for linear system, asymptotic stability is equivalent to exponential stability. So by the choice, a suitable gain of uh, suitable choice of the gain KP and KD, you are able to uh, impose the desired transient behavior to the error. So uh, now. In the linear domain, uh, after having applied the feedback linearization control, which cancels all nonlinearity, we end up with this type of system. So this is uh, the linear version only. Mm -hmm. So once we have obtained q double dot equal a, we have uh, chains of double integrators from each component of a to each component of the output q. Yes. Um, so what we have obtained? We have obtained a system which is uh, differently from the original dynamics of the robot. Uh, the, the controlled robot has a, a linear dynamics, which is invariant from the particular configuration Q, and it's fully decoupled in all its workspace, no matter which velocity it is having. So for instance, the quadratic dependence on the coders and centrifugal term is no longer there. We have completely substituted the original nonlinear dynamics with this linear and decoupled dynamics. And if you look more carefully, it's like having for each joint, so in the joint space where the designs of this controller is being carried uh, over, uh, it's like having for each joint an equivalent unitary mass, m equal 1, subject to the new command. It's like having mi times ai, no? Uh, sorry, mi times q double dot i equal ai, and we would like to stabilize this mass, and the mass has a unitary value. Of course, we can impose also a different value for this, for this equivalent mass, and this is a slight modification that I will do as an exercise to you. So, uh, because of the linear linearity of the error, uh, each error. Uh, have a joint converge to zero not only asymptotically but exponentially and this uh, behavior for instance uh, if we choose a, a suitable ratio between kpi and kvi we may have a critical damping so no overshooting and no oscillation in the response to the error at that joint and the decoupling uh, because every joint coordinates uh, for the control of the robot system uh, has a, uh, an independent evolution, notwithstanding what the other joints are doing, if they are following already correctly their reference or if they are trying to recover the error. So uh, this kind of uh, absence of interaction is called decoupling. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, is a one result which allows to treat uh, a natural multi-input, multi-output control problem because we have many uh, input commands stored to design and many controlled output, the position of the various joints to, to control, uh, still with this synthesis you reduce the problem to uh, a bunch of n independent single input, single output linear system control problems. And this is uh, the equation that I mentioned before. You can look at it in a vector format or because you're choosing diagonal KD and KP matrix for each joint you have this type of evolution and as I said uh, positivity of the gains KDI and KPI is sufficient and necessary for having uh, asymptotic or exponential stabilization now, uh, here I introduce a, a slight variation, and since I'm doing uh, computation uh, step by step, I consider this as a whiteboard slide. I would do this on the blackboard if I was in, in the classroom. 
So let's see what happens if we like to complete the design on the linear side of the problem. So after applying the feedback linearization control uh, with the addition of an integral term. First of all, I uh, rewrite or uh, draw the, origin, the previous uh, diagram, the linear diagram, in a slightly modified uh, way. So to add space for additions. So we have again uh, the double integrator uh, reaction from the state with uh, Kp from the measured Q, uh, Kd uh, from the measured or uh, numerically obtained Q dot, uh, and uh, the A controller, so the A input, takes this feedback plus the feed forward, the combined feed forward with desired acceleration, velocity, and position combined with the same gains. Now, we add an additional term on the linear side, which is an integral term, so that we have a PID controller on the linear side of the problem. So we uh, measure Q, we compare with the desired QD uh, position, we have an error, we integrate the error, and we amplify the uh, integrated error by, again, Ki. Again, uh, the analysis can be done in, in a decoupled way as long as you're uh, using diagonal and positive definite gains. But we will see now that uh, this choice, uh, not the diagonal choice, but the positive uh, gain choice, so namely using uh, all elements on the diagonal of this three matrix as being positive, is not sufficient to guarantee asymptotic stability and then also exponential stability because we are in the uh, linear domain. So uh, let's do uh, some step to show what is needed in this case. Uh, this may remind you of the problem of regulation under PID of a linear mass. So on the linear side of the problem, uh, all the linear system looks the same. So uh, we start with Q double dot equal A, and now the PID controller uh, includes the feed forward of the acceleration, then um, uh, a reaction on the derivative of the uh, position error, so on the velocity error, a reaction proportional to the position error, and another reaction proportional to the history, to the story of the uh, position error, so the PID. Now we define E as QD minus Q, and uh, uh, we now make, uh, again, uh, the, the assumption that all the gains are diagonal, so from now on we will work only on the generic component of the error at joint I, for, with I going from 1 to N. Uh, now we can uh, bring uh, the acceleration on the uh, right hand side, so q double dot i on the right hand side of the first equation and rewrite things in terms only on the error in its uh, derivative, so uh, the acceleration error joint i plus kdi the velocity error plus kpi the position errors plus kpi the integral of the error is equal to zero. Now this is a differential equation in the error uh, it's a linear differential equation because it's a combination of uh, uh, terms which are uh, purely linear operators, so derivation or integration, combined with constant gain, so this is a linear differential equation, we can use Laplace uh, to transform this into the complex domain. So I assume that you have familiarity with this operation, which transforms the solution of differential equation in time to the solution of algebraic equation in the domain, in the transforming domain. So for every derivative you multiply the transform of the signal by a s, for an integration you multiply the transform of the original signal by a factor 1 over s. So uh, in the Laplace domain the equation 2 uh, is represented by the following algebraic equation in the uh, complex variable s. s squared, which underlines the acceleration, so S squared times EAS is the Laplace transform of the acceleration uh, EI double dot of I, plus KDI S, which represents the first derivative, plus KPI, again, times the transform of the error, and again, for the uh, integral term, a factor 1 over S. 
Now, uh, this equation is in fact equivalently represented by multiplying everything by s so that you obtain a polynomial in s. So you have uh, s cubed plus kda i s squared plus kdi s plus ki multiplying all the transform of the error. Now remember that um, the way in which the error would behave depends on the initial uh, state of the error, so the initial integral error, the initial position error, and the initial uh, velocity error. The way in which those components jointly are brought to zero uh, is uh, associated to the roots of the polynomial in front of the terms e of, uh, e of i s in the Laplace domain. So we have to, in order to get asymptotic stability so that all these errors converge to zero, and since we are in the linear domain, if they converge asymptotically to zero, again, they will converge exponentially to zero, this property depends on the fact that the roots of this polynomial are on the left-hand side of the complex plane. Now, if the system, uh, when using the PD control, a necessary sufficient condition is that for having asymptotic stability, so for having the roots of a second-order polynomial uh, all with negative real parts, is that the two gains, Kp and Kd, are positive. Now we will see that for a third order system, so a polynomial of degree C, uh, 3 like this one, this is a uh, necessary condition but not sufficient. So all the gains being positive is certainly necessary in order to have asymptotic stability but not uh, yet sufficient. Uh, in order to see what are the necessary sufficient conditions, we apply uh, the route criteria, which associates to this polynomial a table which has uh, as many rows as the degree of the polynomial. Uh, in the first row we have uh, the coefficient of the uh, odd, de um, odd degree in this case, so 1 for s cube and kpi for s. In the second row of the even uh, degree term, so kdi for s square and k uh, I of E uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, the constant term. And from there on, you build the table according to the rule of this uh, type of determinant style. So uh, for the element in row 1, you uh, multiply the negative of the determinant of the block that is on top. So KDI times KPI minus 1 times KI of I uh, divided by the element which is uh, right on, 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 the, on the first column of the uh, row above. And if you do the same for uh, the last row, uh, since there's a zero in column two, row one, uh, then the result is having the element ki of i uh, moving like uh, a horse on the chessboard to the uh, zero row. So uh, the necessary and sufficient condition for uh, having the roots in the negative complex plane uh, is that uh, the element there's no change of sign in the first column since the first element is one is positive, KDI should be positive, KI I should be positive, and uh, also KDI minus times KPI minus KI should be positive because you divide by KDI which is already positive. So the conclusion is here on, in the box that appeared in the block diagram is that uh, all the gains should be positive but the integral gain should be upper bounded by the product of KPI and KDI. Indeed, you can increase uh, this admissible uh, interval for the integral gain by increasing KPI or KDI. But you have a limitation in this case, which you, an upper bound limitation, which you didn't have in the case of PD control. So a uh, few other remarks uh, is um, on the uh, fact that the desired joint trajectory indeed can, as usual, come from some Cartesian data. In fact, can be generated 
from a trajectory specified at the level of the end effect. Uh, in order to do that, we need to know the uh, initial uh, uh, position and velocity in the Cartesian space, have a profile for the uh, desired acceleration of p double dot of t, and then we can integrate and generate online, if we wish, the reference trajectory in the joint space. Now, you may wonder uh, why we are labeling this as a joint level controller if we could start from Cartesian data. And the reason is, as I explained in my global table at the beginning of this, uh, uh, in the introductory lecture to the control problem for robots, uh, we classify those methods based on where the error is being generated. So even if you're starting with a Cartesian trajectory, if you're uh, generating uh, the trajectory in the joint space, and if you're now building the error with respect to this joint space trajectory, then your control uh, should be classified under joint space controller. And you can see that this uh, inversion, in the case of a square Jacobian, of course you can use all the things that you know about uh, redundancy resolution at this level, if you have more joints than Cartesian uh, variable or task variable, so uh, supposing that the Jacobian is uh, square and non-singular, uh, you have to invert the kinematics in order to initialize the uh, position in the joint space, you have to invert the differential kinematic uh, at the velocity level only in the initial uh, instant in order to get the initial value of the joint of the desired joint velocity and now you can con continuously invert at the acceleration level the trajectory so that you uh, input to the this chain of integrators uh, which is the trajectory planner in the joint space uh, the profile of acceleration uh, starting from the initial desired position and velocity and you obtain the full uh, trajectory in the joint space so that you have available uh, QD, QD dot and Q double dot desired for your controller. Uh, the second very important aspect is that the feedback linearizing law uh, so uh, Uh, U of FBL, I should have written here, uh, can be computed uh, using the efficient uh, inverse dynamic algorithm of Newton oil. The only difference is that you're not using Q desired, Q dot desired, and Q double dot desired. You're using the actual measure Q, the actual measure Q dot, or numerically differentiated Q dot, and in place of the desired acceleration, you're using the uh, new command A, which has been computed as feed forward of acceleration plus PD action or PID action. So an operation that you can do uh, with very simple computation. So this gives a complexity which is linear with the number of joints to the real-time computation of the feedback linearizing controller. And this is a very powerful result. So again, as I said, you use uh, the Euler-Lagrange modeling in order to design and analyze the control laws, but when you implement control laws, you tend to use a newton euler version when you implement model-based uh, controllers, in particular in this case, trajectory tracking control. Uh, another remark which is uh, kind of on the side, so you may wish to simulate your feedback linearization control, for instance, for the KUKA lightweight 7 degrees of freedom robot you generate reference trajectory in the joint space with the seven joints of the, of the robot, you model the robot, you make a lot of effort in finding out the symbolic term, uh, you may have uh, identified the, the dynamic coefficient there, uh, or you may assume to know all the, uh, this data and uh, have the robot model there, and then you decide the feedback linearization control and you complete the design on the linear side, for instance, with, feed, uh, with the PD uh, control plus feed forward of the design acceleration. Now, if you do this, uh, you have to use some true parameters for your system. True parameters, or 
a priori specified parameters which are your uh, baseline value, your ground truth in a sense. And you should use estimated parameter only, so p hat, in the feedback generalization control. Uh, why am I saying this? Because otherwise, the huge effort that you uh, spend uh, setting up this simulation is completely nonsense. Because if you uh, simulate this control law uh, in the ideal case, so when p hat used in the uh, control law, in the feedback linearization controller, uh, is equal to the actual true parameters p, then uh, after a long uh, computation, the evolution of your system will be identical to that of linear and decoupled chains of double integrators stabilized with the PD. So, especially if you're having a high number of degrees of freedom, so a very complex model to simulate, and uh, you may take a while uh, on your computer to simulate the system, while uh, the result would be exactly the same as simply simulating double chains of integrators stabilized with PD. So it makes no sense at all, so I would discourage uh, any uh, young researcher or student to do this if, unless you introduce some perturbation, some practical uncertainty on the parameters. So even if you are in simulation, you can assume that the robot in blue has some true parameters and you have a 10% of error on these parameters while you're computing the feedback linearization control. And then you can see the actual performance of the system, which will be typically different from that of the ideal case. Uh, some uh, few further comments. We have already mentioned that the choice of the diagonal elements of KP and KD will shape the error transient. And you can uh, combine suitably, uh, I mean, use linear theory concept in order to uh, have critically damped trends and so that whatever initial error you have, this is a scalar uh, expression in, the, in this case, uh, this will converge to zero uh, in a desired nice way, so fast enough without oscillation, without overshooting. So everything works provided that the model that you're using is the best possible one. So uh, parametric identification is almost a mess every time you want to use feedback minimization in order to achieve the best possible performance. Uh, another aspect is uh, the choice of in the implementation of a sampling time. Indeed, we have made an analysis which leaves in the continuous time, but our word uh, with controlled uh, um, system is implicitly a, a digital system, so sample quantity, uh, com uh, computer used for uh, evaluating the control law every uh, some uh, interval of time. So uh, when we are moving from the continuous to the discretized version of our controller, everything could preserve the same properties as long as we are sampling enough uh, frequency enough frequent the, the various variables and updating the controller at the same uh, frequent uh, rate. And by frequent, this depends on the dynamics of the system. If you have a heavy robot, if you have a lightweight robot, if you want to go along fast trajectory or not. But by and large, a rule of thumb is working with a sampling time which is uh, from uh, 400 microseconds to 10 milliseconds, then you are on the safe side of the problem. If you start having uh, delays of the order of 20, 50 milliseconds, then you may experience some instability because of the digital implementation of your continuous time law. And finally, uh, this feedback linearization or exact linearization by static state feedback uh, is one example of a very general technique used uh, in nonlinear control theory. And in fact, you can find the same concept applied also to other type of robot system. Uh, we will see just an example, just a highlight of an example in the next and last slide of this part. Uh, and uh, on wheel mobile robot as well, and you can find application in the uh, autonomous mobile robotics course of Professor Royola. 
Uh, and there are other non-robotic applications uh, where uh, this concept has been applied, for instance, in the, motion, in the flying of helicopter, the first helicopter that um, f flew uh, under the control, uh, under feedback acquisition control, uh, has a name which reminds a, a, a mathematician involved in the analysis of nonlinear systems, Frobenius. Um, you can use this for induction motors, you can use this for attitude control of satellites and so on and so on. So in the robotic field, uh, feedback linearization has been introduced even before the theory was developed. And it was, it was named in fact computer torque, this is why I use this terminology in one of the first slides today. Uh, but in fact this is a, a, a simple case in which uh, feedback linearization works. After all, we have seen that uh, we just need to cancel all the nonlinearities, and this is something that you can almost uh, find uh, at first sight. But there are other systems, even in the robotic case, where this is not as trivial as in the rigid case of fully actuated robots. There may be underactuated robots or cases in which uh, not all the joints have an independent actuators, or you may have a, a presence of flexibility, and so on and so on. Uh, still, you may have or you may not have exact linearization by feedback. In fact, in the nonlinear control theory courses, you learn, you may learn uh, necessary and sufficient condition under which there exists uh, a static feedback, and so a feedback from the state, instantaneous feedback from the state of the system, which allows to reach this objective. So let's uh, do another example of feedback linearization design, and as I said, this is just the highlight of what happened. We have seen that we can uh, have a dynamic model under certain assumption, uh, simplifying assumption, of robot with elastic joints. So elasticity is concentrated in the joints, namely represent the fact that the, the transmission elements undergo uh, deformation or they are intrinsically flexible like when we're using harmonic drive as a reduction element. In that case, everything else is rigid, but you need for each joint twice the number of generalized coordinates. So you need a, a coordinate for characterizing the motor position theta. And then after the reduction gear, you will have the elasticity. And then you need another uh, generalized coordinate Q for characterizing the lift position. So if you have a robot with N joint, all of them being uh, elastic, you need a, a set of two N generalized coordinates Q and theta, as opposed to the case of rigid robots, which uh, would have only the n uh, generalized coordinates q. Uh, we have also introduced the inertia matrix of the uh, motors, which are so assumed to be balanced, so the center of mass is in, on the uh, axis of rotation. Uh, and we have introduced a, a, a diagonal matrix, uh, positive David diagonal matrix as well, with the finite stiffness of the joint. So when k goes to infinity, in fact, uh, the uh, joints are infinitely stiff, so they are rigid, and in fact, the theta, theta variable becomes equivalent after reflection from the reduction gear to the link position, and we don't need to introduce uh, this second set of generalized coordinates. So under um, some assumption, in particular, neglecting some uh, extra term in the uh, angular velocity of the motors, in the kinetic energy, expression, then the model looks like uh, the following one. The first set of equations are, in fact, the equation of the link dynamics, and the first three terms are exactly those that you find uh, in the rigid case, but you don't have an explicit, an explicit um, torque acting on the right-hand side. Instead, you have an additional uh, potential-based term and since we are assuming that the formation are small, we have a quadratic potential energy associated to the deformation of the joints, and we, if we take the gradient of this potential term in the Lagrange uh, approach, we get this uh, term k times q minus theta. Remember that k is a diagonal positive definite matrix. Uh, the second set of equation, instead, you can see that it's fully linear and the, the, the assumption that we made, and it's the dynamics are on the motor side. And uh, you see that the inertia of the motors appears there with the acceleration of the motor theta double dot. And 
the same and opposite uh, elastic force is acting on the motor side as uh, it is acting on the link side. And on the right hand side of the uh, Euler Lagrange equation, we have the uh, actuator torque, so the non conservative forces producing motion. We have neglected in this case any dissipative effect. So, uh, if we turn this into a, a state space representation, we would need uh, twice the number of generalized coordinates, so four n state variables, namely q and theta, and their derivative q dot and theta dot. This is one possible choice of state variable. Uh, I remind you that we may have used uh, in place of the velocity the generalized momentum for the system as well. Now the question in this concept, now this is just a, a recap of the dynamic modeling that we have considered as an example uh, of the Euler-Lagrange methodology. Now uh, from the control point of view, uh, we would like to see if for this system there exists an input U uh, obtained by nonlinear feedback which realizes uh, exact linearization of the closed loop system and in particular also possibly decoupling between new input A, which I call A for the same reason as before. Uh, well, actually the reason is different, but I'm using the same notation as before. Uh, and the output, which are the controlled link position. Remember that we are always interested not to control the motors, but to control the actual link position, because from the link position and the direct kinematics, we know also where the end effector of the robot is, and most tasks are defined in terms of the end effector position of the robot. So in our case, this nonlinear feedback would be uh, some nonlinear function of the state, let's call it alpha, plus another nonlinear function of the whole state, or a sub or, or uh, depending on a subset of the state, times the new input A. So the question, is there a feedback? There are indeed necessary and sufficient conditions to check, which involve uh, uh, Lie brackets of vector fields from the state space equation, but there's a simple way to find a constructive answer to this question, and the answer, first of all, is yes. And the final results, uh, result is that when you apply this unique uh, feedback linearization control, you end up not with chains of two integrators, with n chains of two integrators, if n is the number of joints of your system, but in fact with chains of four integrators. And of course, on the linear side of the problem, you need to stabilize this single input, single, system, single output system made of four integrators, and you have to perform a, a PDD type of uh, control design, so you can assign poles to uh, this transfer function with linear techniques. Uh, no wonder that the uh, level of differentiation between the new input AI and the controlled output I has grown from 2 to 4. In fact, uh, this system uh, has a relative degree 4 as opposed to the system, uh, the religious system, which had a relative degree 2, so after 2 derivative of the uh, output position, so at the acceleration level, in the rigid case you feel the action of the input U, in the uh, elastic joint case, so in the system modeled by the equation 1 and 2 in this slide, uh, if you take the output Q and you take the second derivative, you can see from the first equation that Q double dot, if you isolate Q double dot, you will not get any direct relationship with U because U is in the second equation. You have to differentiate farther Q double dot two more times so to get into uh, uh, an effect of the input U on this higher order derivative. And this is the reason why you get a fourth order system when you're cancelling by feedback all nonlinearities. In fact, the hint in order to get this result and the actual form of the control law alpha plus beta of A uh, is to take the first equation in the model, so the link dynamics, differentiate it symbolically one and two times. Uh, if you do this, uh, you will have a first term, a leading term, which is m of q times q 
fourth dot, so the fourth derivative of the uh, position of the jump of the links, but you will have in this uh, twice differentiated equation also theta dot appearing as the last term on the left hand side of equation one. And this theta double dot can be substituted from the theta double dot in the second equation. So at this level, theta double dot is affected by u, and so q fourth dot will be affected by u. Once you have this expression, uh, so only one fourth order uh, differential equation, uh, you may uh, choose u so to cancel all nonlinearities and replace to the fourth order derivative of q uh, the new variable a. And you can do this in a decoupled way so that you have a chain of four integrals. And this completes the design. It's kind of heavy, computation intensive, but it's a very powerful design. In the, in the case where you have the perfect knowledge of all the uh, dynamic terms in your system, including the stiffness of the joints, uh, then this is the best possible uh, design in order to achieve trajectory track. And I would uh, stop uh, for today this lecture now. Thanks you for listening.